Welcome to Chain Reaction, the Foreign Policy Research Institute's flagship network of podcast series examining the political, security, economic, and social trends shaping Europe and Eurasia. Throughout the year, we're talking with experts about developments in Russia's war in Ukraine, the new European security order, the past, present, and future of the Baltic states, Russia's political economy, and great power competition in the region. Join us each month for Bear Market Brief, Baltic Ways, Report, in short, The Continent, and of course, our flagship, Chain Reaction. New episodes are available each week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. This week on the Bear Market Brief. With Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine now stretching into its third year, we're seeing a lot of debate in the West. There are political questions, whether or not there's will among the general public to continue supporting Ukraine. And then there are policy questions. How do we deal with Russia? How do we hamper its ability to continue prosecuting this war? On this episode, we're going to be talking about the latter, the question of economic policy and sanctions. These are questions that actually go back to 2014, but since the invasion, they've become all the more relevant. Welcome to a new season of the Bear Market Brief podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Schwartzbaum. I'm glad to be back, and I'm glad you're back too. This season, I want to spend more time not just talking about critical news stories, we'll continue to do that, but also thinking about how we think about policy, in this case, economic statecraft. So then, to business. Has Russia won the quote-unquote sanctions war? To explore this question, I invited some heavy hitters by the podcast today, Nick Trickett and Ika Korhonen. Dr. Ika Korhonen has been the head of the Bank of Finland Institute for Emerging Economies, BAFIT, since 2009. He has extensively researched economic policy of emerging economies, economic sanctions, and the correlation of business cycles and corruption. He has also worked as a visiting professor in Japan and Ukraine, and as a visiting researcher at the central banks of Austria and Hong Kong. Nick, who, if you're a regular listener, you may have heard from before, is a senior mining and metals analyst with the Investing in Energy team at S&P Global Commodity. He holds an MA in Regional Studies with a focus on energy politics from the European University in St. Petersburg, and a Master of Science in International Political Economy from LSE. He is currently working on a forthcoming book for Hearst titled Empire of Austerity, Russia and the Breaking of Eurasia. Before we dive in, a quick caveat that all of us are speaking for ourselves only and not our respective employers. So let's answer the question. Ika, Nick, welcome to the Bear Market Brief. Uh, Let's start this episode traditionally, as this is our inaugural episode this season, with quick intros. Ika, you first. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So my name is Ika Korhonen. I'm head of uh, Bank of Finland Institute for Emerging Economies, which is a a unit within the Finnish Central Bank that, as the name implies, we mostly cover weak emerging market countries. China and especially Russia. And I've been working on Russia for 25 years on and off. A lot of experience. So we're very excited to have you by today. Uh, Nick, you're a friend of the podcast. Over to you. Just remind the audience about yourself. Hi, my name is Nick Trickett. Um, I am a senior analyst covering mining and metals with uh, S&P Global Commodity Insights and specifically in the kind of financial client advisory team. So it's it's more on the, on the kind of money side than it is just the sponsor side. More broadly, I've been working on Russia since about 2015 um, when I studied there um, and have like a broader background in oil and gas, other commodities, political risk, macro. And and once upon a time, I actually was the editor in chief for um, BNB. Yeah, we have a economist economist with us today, a political economist with us today. I think we're very well equipped to tackle our question of the day. So turning to the question of the day. Uh, we're evaluating whether Russia has won the sanctions war. Uh, it's been a take I've seen argued. And what I want to do is, assuming the arguments being made in good faith, kind of open the hood and understand why someone would argue that, what they might use to argue that, whether or not there's grounds to make that argument. So let's stop very, very top line, as we'd say, with Russia's overall growth number. I think the IMF predicted it's going to clock in this year roughly like I thought it was 2.4, 2.5% GDP growth, which is pretty good given the circumstances. Where do we find Russia's economy as we start 2024? Ika, we'll let you take the lead on that one. Well, uh, if you look at the, the forecast that were made in the winter of 21, 22, I mean, just before the, the invasion, Compared to those, Russian economy is 
three or four percent smaller than it would have been without the without the uh, invasion, without the sanctions, without all the all the uncertainty that is related to to war. So in that sense, uh, Russia is doing much worse than it could have been. And to to compare, say, GDP growth numbers in twenty twenty four for various countries without taking into account what happened before and where the countries could have been, I think it's uh, misleading. Dick, though, so we do have, yes, Russia, I think certainly fair to say, worse than it could have been. Why is Russia's economy still growing? What has allowed it to be, I guess, resilient? I don't want to use too loaded a word, but wh- why do we see that growth? Yeah, so I think that the basic answer is a lot of spending on defense. Um, and there, there's, there are some other aspects to this, but but the largest thing is simply there's been such a massive increase in the actual procurement of weapons and the people you have to employ to make things for the military, et cetera, that people are are able to buy more because, you know, um, either because they're employed and more so than they were before, whether it means more hours or actually just new jobs, or otherwise wages are going up because there simply isn't enough labor in the country. So if you are able to actually land one of those jobs, you, you get paid more. So, you know, one, one of the kind of weird problems of parsing out what's happening in the Russian economy is that, you know, when you have this initial burst of growth related to defense spending, there'll be a period of time where people's wages go up because obviously in a tight, tight leg market, normally that happens. But the problem then becomes that inflation tends to rise as well with, um, with wage increases at the scale that we're seeing. And the problem is even more exacerbated by the fact that, you know, so many consumer goods are imported that if people are making lots more money in real terms and they're able to afford these imports, let's, let's assume things are going well because it's it, it gets complicated at, at the level of different products. Um, then the more imports you actually are, you know, are, are taking in, the the weaker the rule becomes, unless you have, um, you know, a lot more money coming in from oil and gas, other exports. So it's it's a it's a situation where on paper things might look actually really good, but under the hood, it's a really unstable kind of like I guess destabilizing is the best word, destabilizing form of growth, um, especially because if military spending is creating all this demand and all this all this money going into people's pockets, the war actually has to continue. <laughs> for that activity to take place. And also the things that they're making, if you make a bullet or a tank, it's going to be consumed once until it's destroyed. It's not like you're making, you know, something that's going to be used over and over again. Yeah, so, sorry, the, I mean, the Russian Ministry, Ministry of Finance, basically they, they estimate that the fiscal impulse, so the contribution of uh, extra spend, extra public spending on GDP was plus 5%, both in 22 and 23. So it, it's been huge. That's a, rather rather large figure so i think both of those both of those comments and insights we have more to unpack one of the questions i want to talk about as we talk about military spending and uh the impacts of the economy i guess part of the argument about russia winning the sanctions war quote unquote is that they're still able to produce a lot of artillery and import a lot of goods i want to talk about that but i think we need to cover some grounds first about what sanctions are actually in place um, against Russia's economy to, to actually evaluate this question. So, I mean, we don't have to get down to um, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, single line items, which companies, but broadly, what are the measures that were in place before the war and what's new? Ika, we'll start with you there. Well, things that have been in place basically since 2014 have been, uh, well, first of all, there have been sanctions on individuals. Uh, they have been sort of barred from traveling to U.S. or, or EU, EU countries. And then more importantly, uh, many of the state-owned, state-owned enterprises and especially banks have been basically barred from uh, borrowing from uh, EU or G7 countries. So that actually already was a fairly significant step for many of the EU countries. Nick, over to you. What other what other measures? Uh, I think since the war, too, I think is worth specifically. Talking yeah, about. I, mean, I think that's actually a bit more relevant anyway, because um, sanctions measures that existed prior to the war were, were significant, but not particularly effectual necessarily, depending on your on your metrics. The, the, bi- the biggest changes have been basically that you know Russian banks can no longer access U.S. dollars or euros, of, you know, from, from counterparty banks um, in the West. Um, in, you know, increasingly, more, more recently, pressure from the U.S. means that Chinese banks are also more more anxious to kind of offer access to yuan you know, to be able to settle you know, trade with Russia as well. Um, you know, I think the most important restrictions in terms of specific goods relate to semiconductors, dual use goods. There have been attempts to basically sanction or or go after people who are um, you know buying and selling goods that could be used by the military in the end, 
through third countries. Obviously, the the degree of pressure has shifted over time, and it's gotten a bit tighter in the last you know eighteen months. But but that's like a, like a large change. Um, and I think that actually the most important measures um, from the last year relate more to the EU simply just refusing to buy specific Im- you know, imports from Russia, which then then in this case you know, oil, not yeah, gas, but oil. And they've started expanding that into you know some specific metals products. Um, and, and, and other inputs from the commodity space. And doing that in concert with this kind of price cap that the G7 came up with for Russian oil exports and specifically Euros blend exports. Um, the point being that because the EU doesn't buy it, it has to go somewhere else. And if the market is oversupplied, and, uh, and obviously the market conditions have fluctuated in the last couple of years, if the market's oversupplied, it's much easier for somebody buying that oil to demand a large discount. And in this case, you know, a discount below the $60 a barrel um, ceiling that they tried to impose. Now, not all, not all Russian oil is actually being traded at that um, per that that price cap, but it still has a significant impact on the market and it distorts who ends up buying it. Um, and so, on, on, on the whole, we've basically seen a kind of ratcheting up the pressure on Russia's ability to access foreign currency and its ability to make money off its exports, as well as access specific goods it needs for the war. On the on the oil price cap, I mean, China is of course not part of it. But when we look at the Chinese customs data, I mean, we can calculate they are still getting. Five six percent discount on Russian oil, with in comparison to to crude oil from anywhere else. And before invasion, there was no such discount. And mm-hmm. actually, Indians are getting even a bigger bigger discount. Yeah, and it and it applies to other goods as well. Though they've they've changed over time. So since since the invasion, China has been able to buy Russian coal at a significant discount, for instance. And a lot of Russian metals products that have moved to China typically trade at like ten percent, twenty percent discounts. So Russia. In plain English, five-year-old version for people like me that they can't sell their goods for as much as they used to. So there's less money. Basically, yeah. yeah basically, yeah. So we've talked about what the West, or as Putin and his his uh, friends might say, the collective West. Um, what hasn't the West done? Are there any aces in the hole or other measures that have been talked about but not implemented for fear of escalation? Or are we kind of at the upper limit of sanctions? I'll open the floor to either of you. I would say that there's there's considerable space to increase pressure given that this the current sanctions regime is not as intense as the Iranian sanctions regime, for example. So there there are existing regime or North Korea. We have existing kind of sanctions regimes that are even more extreme. So more pressure can be placed on companies. Um, more countries can be um, formally sanctioned or, or secondary sanctions can be formally announced on more goods or more forms of, act, of economic activity with Russian counterparties. Um, but in practical terms, we're probably r- running towards the upper limit of what sanctions are going to achieve in terms of affecting the course of the war. So we, we have to look more at some, like actual aid to Ukraine directly, but and also the way you can shape markets and try to shape behavior of other states that are still trading with Russia. That's kind of a different problem, ultimately, than just sanctions. Basically, we, we wanted the, the physical oil from Russia to continue to flow so that we don't upset the global markets too much. And that, that, has, that has happened. Uh, I mean, we could try to push down the, the oil price cap. We could try go after, as we, we have now done, uh, different uh, shipping companies, whether they are in uh, Dubai or wherever, or then try to go after various financial institutions in different countries, sort of try to get them to give up their business with, with Russians. And it seems that the U.S. Treasury is doing this both in China and in Turkey. And now, I mean, just basically on the on the way here, I, I was reading that uh, this also is now happening happening with the, some banks in the United Arab Emirates. And if that happens, that's actually quite significant because a lot of the trade between India and, and Russia, actually the money flows through uh, uh, Dubai. Small comment on top of that too, because obviously this, this relates to the debate about whether or not sanctions are working. It's also important to remember that you know, back in 2022, when sanctions were first imposed, over the course of that year, China, Chinese economy was basically under lockdown in, in, in many, in, over most of those months and in many different provinces. So. We kind of got lucky that the, the, the initial sanction shock wasn't even more extreme for the oil market and for energy markets, et cetera. So, so we, we, there's also a bit of, of, um, of kind of like luck involved in shaping these measures and getting them to work effectively that I think we, we just have to acknowledge as a thing. Not the first place luck would be involved. I know with Russia turning off gas, you know, it had an unusually warm winter for Europe. So another kind of piece of luck there. So let's now turn to to Russia's economy. So we talked about immense military spending boosting GDP growth, I think Ika, you said it's up 5% or as a, as a contributing factor. If we're not looking at top line growth to measure where sanctions or the war broadly are having an impact, where are we looking uh, in Russia's economy? What what are you seeing, Nick? 
Yeah. So I think you're looking first off at, at the specific cost increases for basic goods like food um, and, and other kind of staples, because, you know, prior to the invasion, somewhere between 37 and 40 percent of the average kind of household spend was basically on, on, on basics. Right. Which much higher, actually, than, than most economies at similar levels of development. But but yeah, so you're, look, you're looking at those metrics. You were looking at wh- whether or not the official data on inflation matches the actual increase of prices that people are paying, generally speaking, w- within the index. You're looking at how short of labor different different businesses and parts of the economy are because the the longer the war drags on and more people are mobilized um, and also obviously people have left the the harder it is to manage that from the perspective of the stability of the economy um, and I think that by the last the last one I would look at is really how much uh, business investments actually taking place for stuff that serves consumer de- consumer <clears throat> demand domestically we are looking at or try to sort of drill down on the production side at a very granular level on say a manufacturing trying to see if any other sectors, uh, despite, uh, apart from the, those that are directly serving military, are actually increasing uh, their production, and, and they're not. Uh, construction is still increasing quite a bit, also because the housing loans have been are now subsidized, basically, on almost all of them. We are also trying to look at uh, sort of in, in fairly great detail uh, other countries' exports to Russia. So... If we look at the the customs codes of the things that we have sanctioned, if other countries' exports to Russia have been, or if, if increase in them has been large enough to sort of offset the things that Russia has lost, and in most cases it's it hasn't been. The I mean, I mean the exports have gone up, but not nearly enough to replace the things that they have lost on the import side from EU and and Japan and South Korea. So. But of course, then when you go really down into sort of the level of individual goods, there are goods where they have been able to, to gain access to to, uh, to markets apart from the EU and, uh, and East, East Asian countries. Nick is itching to say something here. Yeah, yeah well, building on that, um, I think it's important to also note that you know, because export, their export earnings are not making up losses, you know, you're in a situation where you know, lacking access to um, to essentially foreign currency via Western banks, the way that they maintain access to foreign currency is by making money off their exports. And and so, you know, and, and, be, and because of the situation that they find themselves in, it, it also kind of imposes a constraint on their ability to spend money because the more they spend, the more they're going to import. Because obviously, historically speaking, you know, spending for the state in, in Russia that has um, boosted consumption tends to boost imports um, if, if it goes to households. And so what, what that really means is that, you know, you also want to look at what the real levels of spending are on non-military items in the budget. And, and if you see structurally, they're slowly slashing away at other things and trying to find savings where they can. And, and that those are going to filter out and create really negative consequences across the economy. A great example, which isn't just about the budget, but it's partially about the budget, would be the, you know, increase in uh, problems with like utilities, you know, heating and so on that people have seen across Russian cities in the last six months. So I guess two two questions, kind of bread and butter statements in the political risk space and we'll stay with nick for this one so first that russia has a low debt to gdp ratio so it can afford to take on more debt have we seen russia being more profligate with its spending and i know russia traditionally and i'm asking nick because he's writing a book about this um russia's traditionally been hesitant to run deficits relating to the defaults of 1998 um is russia spending more where did where would it get money from? Where would it borrow money from, even if it wanted to? What does that picture look like right now? Yeah, so I mean, they, they can like, technically just borrow from themselves, right? They can they can just create create domestic debts and, ha- and force the banks to hold them. Um, the, the larger point though would be that you know yeah they're running deficits in the range of two to three percent of GDP. It, it it'll dep- it depends a bit on 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 kind of post year revisions and so on. Like whenever you look at data, um, but for context, between about. 2009, 2010, and let's say 2021. If you adjust it for the um, the, re- the real kind of terms value of, of you know, the, the budget spend versus you know the size of the deficit in GDP, Russia ran a a kind of collective deficit, if you will, for that time period of just one percent of GDP, and that's that's through multiple massive shocks that had huge ramifications for the economy. Uh, 2014, 2015 is a bit of a different case, but regardless, that's very unusual for an economy, and it has really really negative effects. So one of the reasons why the economy has bounced back the way it has is because so it's been so starved of spending that relatively marginal increases actually have a really pronounced impact on in terms of the fiscal impulse to use the, the kind of phrase that he has pointed to. Um, right now, they are obviously spending more, but because 
any increase in spending as it filters into um, you know, people's pockets in various ways ends up increasing imports because they can't just make these various consumer goods easily at home. Um, the main constraint they have on spending is actually inflation. And, and particularly because they're controlling the flow of money in and out of the country. And so because they're having a hard time controlling inflation, they, they can't really spend that much more. So that's, they have to cut spending elsewhere to kind of make it balance. You got the, the, the second the second piece here that what was talked about. So it's um, low debt to GDP ratio. And then the second piece, oh, Russia's economy is starved of investments broadly. And Nick just talked about this. I guess the question is, we were talking about these non-productive investments, you could call them bullets and tanks are used once until they blow up. What does the longer term picture look like? It's hard to predict you know, how or when this war might end, but the way I've kind of conceived it is broadly that Russia has essentially been mortgaging its future a little bit, that we're just moving spending to now on non-growth driving investments. What are we seeing there? It's kind of a broad question, but we'll I think you're exactly right. I mean, they have been now pouring money into these uh, investments that are basically one-off. And as Nick said, I mean, basically you, you, you take out an old Soviet tank from storage, you refurbish uh, some new electronics and new optics, it's sent to Ukraine and blown up and Russian GDP went up. I mean, that's the, that's the logic of the, of the, of, of GDP. Uh, it doesn't add to anybody's welfare, certainly, and it doesn't add to sort of future productive capacity or productivity of, of Russian economy. Actually, I, I think on the, on the contrary. This year, the budget foresees that the military spending will be 6% of GDP. And on top of that, you have 2% on what they call internal security. So this is not Soviet numbers, not yet anyway. But still, if you look at all the countries of the world, I mean, this is one of the highest military spendings anywhere. So clearly they are intent on, on winning the war, I mean, within this year. This is a huge spending. And of, then, of course, for next year, they are actually forecasting that uh, government spending will drop, even in nominal terms. And that if that actually happens, that would be a sort of major recession in, in Russian economy. Uh, on top of the sort of just putting money into things that are not productive and don't add to the uh, sort of productive capacity of the economy, the war and everything that is associated with that has actually made also demographic problems even worse. So you basically have several hundreds of thousands of men, I think mostly men, have been taken out of labor force, either sent to the front or then they have fled the country. And uh, I think that we will also have a big, big negative effect going forward. And that uh, exacerbates kind of the trend that I, I want to make it very clear. People fleeing the country is fairly unique to Russia right now, maybe to Ukraine too. But like the lack of young people versus old people was affecting Russia much as it is affecting Europe right now in the United States. But that was kind of an existing yeah. structural factor that is now, I guess you could say, maybe getting maybe getting worse. Nick, what about the oil and gas sector, kind of the all importance? How, how has the war and sanctions impacted that? I know Russia was in a place where it would struggle to keep up overall like lift and production volumes. Where do, where do we see that these days? Yeah, so I mean, the, the Russian oil sector has been resilient um, because you know they're, they're really good at finding ways of, of dealing with shortfalls and kind of getting access to what they need by um, you know, new new counterparties in China or, or Korea, Japan, et cetera. It's something might not be formally sanctioned. And also, frankly, lots of the Western contractors that help with the drilling are still there. So that it's not like it was a total shutdown <clears throat> of their ability to, to, to function. I think what's more interesting and, and, and more relevant, and, and, and a lot of this is also hard to parse out because of how much information has been classified or just no longer readily published, is you know production's fallen by, let's say, roughly half a million barrels a day. In the range of that, it'll, it, it fluctuates up and down in, in compliance with um, with the OPEC cuts. But drilling activity, um, you know, is up like eight to ten percent, and that obviously implies that they're they're less productive in terms of every well, well that they're actually drilling. And really, what that means is just that they, they are they're choking everything they can out of the oldest oil fields they have, and are well aware that they probably won't be able to get the newer projects to market in time to actually make much money off of them. So, I mean, they're, they're still going to throw money at like Bustwok, for example. It's a big Rosneft project, you know, and it, it, and work will be you know will be done on it and take place. But by the time it's actually operational and, and at whatever scale it ends up being operational at, they'll probably be too late, frankly, for the market. So it'll be replacing existing production as opposed to actually you know, increasing production. So what happens to economies when 
they demobilize? I know they probably shrink. There's less spending. But what kinds of specific effects do we see? Well, like in all countries that are actually engaging in fairly large size military actions, they need to demobilize. They, they need to find jobs for the, all these men who are there in the front, uh, who are fighting. Um, what these jobs will be, I, I don't know. I mean, for a lot of, lot of the people from uh, poorer regions, this actually, in terms of economics, this has been fairly sort of good deal. They have been able to get much higher salaries than they otherwise uh, otherwise would have been. I don't know if they will be happy or unhappy when, when, when the war ends. But certainly, certainly when the war ends, then the state will need to redirect its spending again away from military military spending to healthcare, education, and so on. And that will mean that all those industries that have been now been serving uh, military, military needs will need to shrink as well. So there will be some costs uh, associated with uh, sort of, again, shifting uh, resources from one se- sector to another. Nick, any commentary on, on that piece? Yeah, I think the only other thing I'd add is that, um, you know, it's not a perfect example because I would argue that the Russian economy is not like fully mobilized for war despite everything that's happened. But, um, you know, if you look at an historical example um, in which like a, a, a relatively speaking market economy uh, demobilizes at scale after being to- you know fully mobilized and take the U.S. after World War II, uh, that, that process of reallocating resources also tends to create some inflation. Because you have these kind of mismatches of supply and demand, um, but within the kind of submarkets that spill over into each other. So there's also going to be a kind of dislocation when it comes to prices and how expensive things are that people might not like in the, in the kind of early stages of that. One quick follow up question here, and then we'll turn to our last question, because you mentioned Russia's not fully mobilized. What would full mobilization look like? Is that even possible? Yeah, so I think that it's an open question. I would argue it's not uh, in the current the current Russian state is not able to actually do it effectively. Um, but full full mobilization would be really you know service requirement for everybody at a, a certain age range, um, more direct control um, over the actual allocation of resources at, at the level of businesses, um, you know, rationing, uh, you know various things like that. I mean, rationing is already kind of happening implicitly since yeah, there 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 have been more and more regional products shortages for like diesel and other things uh, since you know since really late twenty twenty two. Let's say. But yeah, I, I, I'm much more activist and basically explicitly controlling kind of role for the state in economic policy as opposed to relying primarily on spending. So let's come to a, a verdict here and then we'll have one, this final question, bit of a fun one. But the verdict, so has, has Russia won the sanctions war? If you were arguing for or against it, what would be your like, quick answer to that question? No, uh, I think the war is still going on, uh, including the sanctions war. I mean, it's just... Enforcing the sanctions is a sort of constant struggle or game of whack-a-mole. That once you, one one sort of a hole is plugged, then it takes a few months for the various middlemen to find some other route to through which circumvent the sanctions, and then authorities will try to go after them them again. So in that sense, uh, no, Russia has not won the sanctions war. I I always think of. Um... Charlie Wilson's war with Philip Seymour Hoffman's character, you know, tells that whole parable about the guy from the village in Afghanistan, whoever, who always says, we'll see. The basic point is no, uh, it, we're, we're in round two or three of a very long conflict. Even if, 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 if the actual fighting on the front goes to a stalemate and kind of dies down, it, the war won't be over. And even if Ukraine were to liberate all territory in Ukraine, there's no guarantee that Russia would simply say, no, we're done. So I, I think it's, it's impossible to, to meaningfully answer the question, but the short answer is no. Let's try for an even shorter answer. So one of my favorite uh, stories of Russian political economy of all time, I believe, was British Prime Minister John Major asking Boris Yeltsin to describe Russia's economy in a word in the 90s. Very tough time. Boris Yeltsin said, good. And then Major said, how about two words? And Boris Yeltsin said, not good. So I'm giving each of you, not about the sanctions war specifically, but about Russia's economy. You have, I'll give you up to three words each to tell me about where we see Russia's economy now. Nick, I'll let you take the first whack at this one. Da nyet naverna. Which uh, translates to uh, probably not, but the literal components there are yes, no, probably. Do you care to elaborate, Nick? Yeah, like it, it's like things on the surface look fine and things seem to be held together, but it's all held together by duct tape. So it, it does, it's, not, it's not lasting. Mm. And Nika, over to you. But better than tomorrow. <laughs> Love it. Uh, very pithy, very pithy answers from both of you uh, to that last one. Uh, very enlightening answers to the rest of the questions. 
Uh, thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, thank you for being part of the Bear Market Brief. Thanks for having us. Thanks very much. Thanks again to Ika and Nick, and to you, listener, for joining this episode. So what do you think? Are the sanctions working? What does working even mean? Let us know and follow the brief at the Twitter and or X handle at Bear Market Brief. The Bear Market Brief is a project of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, that's FPRI, a nonpartisan think tank based in Philadelphia. For more information on this initiative and on many others, visit FPRI.org. We'll catch you next time.